Hello, family. My name is Pastor Kingsley, and I'm very grateful for the privilege to be sharing the truth of God's word with you again. Um, and before I go on, I encourage you, click the subscribe button and also press the like button, and that will help us to spread this word throughout YouTube. And for those of you who belong to our local fellowship, have a look around. I'm back in very familiar settings and um, just to whet your appetite by God's grace, which is to, for something that's to come soon enough. Um, but just get your Bibles and join with me as we tuck into the truth of God's word. We're just going to dive in, take a bath, just run around in it and just come back out clean and happy. Okay, so um, I'm going to continue where we were um, last week I shared about meditating in the Word of God. So we're going to continue on with that. And um, if you had the privilege of listening, um, let me ask you this question. Did you apply what you learned? Did you give yourself to it? Or are we guilty of just hearing it and not doing it? There's a big problem with that if we are just accumulating information but not applying it. So I'm encouraging you, please, as we hear this, the Word of God, um, apply it to yourself. Take a few minutes out to go through what I'm doing, to practice what I'm doing. Make it your own. Find out your own way of doing this, of meditating the Word of God. But this will bring the Word to life in your life and your surroundings. So please um, make sure that you um, be a part, be a partaker of what God is saying, okay? The scriptures emphasize meditation a lot more than it does study or even reading the Word. And for, I, I, I'm guessing that's one of the reasons a church we are not taking our place the way we should because we don't give enough time to this scriptural practice of meditating the Word of God. So let's get it into gear. Let's put our foot down on the pedal and let's step on this thing. Let's get this thing going. Let's begin to meditate in the truth of God's Word together. Um, I'm going to open up in Romans chapter 10, verse 8 to 9. And why I'm doing that is I want us to understand that the Word of God wants us to employ this connection between our heart and our mouth. The Word of God is very, it, it, it talks about this in various places, that there is a connection between your heart and your mouth. So you can read the Word, you can study the Word, and that's very good. It's going to be very beneficial. But unless you get the Word engaged in your mouth, and you begin to muse on it and mutter it and begin to speak it into your life daily, then we will not, we are not likely to see the power of God's word um, taking place in our lives. God knows why he tells us to do things. And again, I say, echo what I said last time. If we want what God says, we have to do what God says. Okay, if we want his results, his way, let's do what he says. So, um, for that principle of the mouth and, and the heart connection, uh, Romans 10 verse 8 says this, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So right from verse 8, you can see there's this connection between the heart and the mouth. The word is in your mouth and in your heart. Verse 9 says, confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart. Verse 10 says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it's imperative, it's important that we, we step into this heart-mouth connection, that we as believers begin to engage and put the word in our mouth. A lot of us have allowed this principle to slip by us. And too many other things are coming from our, our tongue. Too many other things are being spoken and uttered, but not the truth of God's word. 
So I encourage us from this moment, if you didn't hear the message last week, go back and listen to it um, and, and grab hold of these truths and let's apply ourselves to them. We read from um, Joshua 1, 8 the last time. So let's have a look at that again. Joshua 1 and verse 8. It says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Don't let this word depart from your mouth. Don't let it depart from your mouth. Meditate in it day and night. So let's give a little um, etymological understanding of what that word means. The Hebrew word. Now, I'm, if I try to pronounce that word, I'm likely to get it wrong. So the Hebrew word has this meaning to it. It means to speak. means to ponder by muttering. Ponder by muttering. And again, I echo, when we talk about scriptural meditation, we are not talking about blanking your mind. Um, you know, letting your mind go quiet. And no, we're not talking about it. Don't try that. Don't let your mind go quiet. No, whenever you want to meditate on the things of God, put the word in your, in your mind. Ponder it by muttering. Okay? And your, your head will always stop to hear what your mouth has to say. So if your head's speaking, just begin to, you, 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 you stop it by putting the word of God in your mouth. Some of us, we got trouble with thoughts and all kinds of contemplations coming our way. Begin to engage the word in your mouth. Your mind will stop to hear what your mouth has to say. And if you keep that principle up, you will control the way your mind is going. So this word means to speak, ponder by muttering. Continual contemplation over something. And I like this. It means the outward sounds of contemplation. So whatever's going on in here, you're beginning to speak it. It can mean to moan. It can mean to roar. And it has other definitions. And one of the things that amplifies to us, particularly in this term moaning, is that you can meditate both in the positive and the negative. Understand, you can be caught meditating just as much or maybe more on things that are negative rather than on the things of God. And I dare say that a whole lot of us have been caught, particularly in the season that we're in, there are so many negatives happening, ne negative things happening, that if we are not careful, we're caught meditating on those negative things rather than the truth of God's word. So I want to just briefly just go through just a few more scriptures that speak about meditation. And we're just going to go through that. Then I'm going to give you one brief example again of how to meditate the word of God. And then we're going to close. So Psalms 63 and verse 6. It says, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. When I remember you on my bed. I meditate on you in the night watches. What a picture to, to lay on your bed, thinking on God, meditating about him. Wow. Just allowing your words and your mind to begin to speak about how you see God. Now, let me encourage you with something. Don't just conjure up an image of God out of thin air. It's important for you to begin to see him in light of how he reveals himself from the word so don't just go plucking things up from thin air and saying oh i think god is like this okay yeah that'll do no it won't do we're not crafting our own image of god we're not shaping putting our own shape to god we see him how he reveals himself through the word and the one of the greatest revelations of god the father is in the face of the lord jesus christ if you can see the Lord Jesus, you see the Father. You see, he, he exemplifies, he, he, he demonstrates what the Father is like and what the heart of the Father is. When Jesus came and walked in the earth, he demonstrated the heart of God through the gospel. So capture what God is like through the person of Jesus. Brilliant. So take time to do that. Let's look at Psalm 77 and verse 12. I will also meditate on all your work 
and talk of all your deeds. Beautiful. I will meditate. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. So here, a, a wonderful principle, having a look at what God does, having a look at the things that God has done, having a look at what God is doing in our lives. How many of us stop and take stock to consider what God is actually doing in our lives? Have we considered the works of God in our lives? Have we considered the blessings and the grace of God upon our lives today? Have you, have you spent time meditating upon that today? Have you spent time meditating on what God has done for you, for your house? Sometimes we end up looking so much on what's not working. We end up looking so much at what's not going right that we forget God's presence in our lives. We forget what God is doing in our lives. We forget what God has done in our lives. And when you're in that place, I guarantee you, you're going to be miserable, you're going to be stressed, and you're likely to move into depression when you forget what God has done for you. Meditate upon his works. Meditate upon the deeds of God. What has God done? Even look through, from, from, through the old covenant. Have a look through the new covenant. E exalt God for the things he has done in people, other people's lives, let alone your own. And just look at his deeds. Look at the creation around you and meditate. Take time to spend thinking about the works of God. And as you do that, you will undoubtedly step into the place of thanksgiving as you meditate on what God has done. Psalms 119, verse 27. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so shall I meditate on your wonderful works. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so shall I meditate on your wonderful works. There again, we are spending time thinking about what God has done, the works of God, how God has saved us, how God has forgiven us, how God has transformed our lives, how God has placed us in the family of the church and seeing and understanding how important that is and that we understand that we are not alone, we are never alone. That's why believers should belong to a local church so that you're not left alone. Understand you have family and give thanks for your natural family. Give God thanks for good neighbors. <laughs> Those things we take for granted. But if you've got a bad neighbor, mm, it's not a nice day. Give God thanks for good neighbors. Give God thanks for everything around us, for our jobs, for the works of God. Psalms 45, 145 sorry, and verse 5. Psalms 145 verse 5. says, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. A different Hebrew word is used here, but it carries exactly the same meaning as to keep the word in your mouth and to ponder it in your mind. And so here it is, we are going to meditate on the glorious splendor of God's majesty. Wow. Taking time to consider how massive God is, how brilliant, how, how huge he is. Go out, step outside in the day or particularly at night where you can see all the stars. You may be able to see the moon and you just have a, a, a snapshot of the grandeur and the majesty of your God. <laughs> when you understand that this earth is so small in comparison to the sun that we have, which is millions of miles away. And you consider that every day these things are going through their course and going through their, 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 their journey. And you don't, even have to, you don't even have to worry about it and think about it. But all this is happening all the time. And the huge universe that we are part of. Consider all of that and you will have a glimpse of the majesty of our great God. He's big man. He's mega big. And he is glorious we, we even when we look at all this, the scriptures say that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Everything around us is displaying how great and grand our God is. Wow. But I'm going to take just a couple minutes. I'm going to just meditate with the scripture with you. I'm encouraging you open the scripture with me and let's just spend two minutes, three minutes. We're going to go through it 
and just going to bring an emphasis just for ourselves and this is how I do it and I encourage you to do this too you will never be the same so turn with me into Isaiah 53 and verse 3 and for context I'm going to read from verse 3 to 5 but then I'm going to just spend time meditating on verse 4 so Isaiah 53 verse 3 says he is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him he was despised and we did not esteem him surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. So every part of that is so significant and powerful. But I'm only going to take a snapshot of that, just a little snippet from verse 4. And we're going to spend time just reading that and meditating on that okay but I am encouraging you man grab spend time meditating in verse 3 spend time meditating in verse 5 there's some riches and nuggets from the Word of God that if we dig in we will see the treasure we will find the treasure remember God says that his word is life to those that find it and health to all their flesh so there's a place of finding God's Word you don't find God's Word just by reading it you don't find God's Word just by skirting over the top of it you find and locate the treasure that's in his word by meditating in the truth of his word so here we go verse 4 says this I'm just taking the beginning of verse 4 and it says this surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And let me read an, a literal translation of that before I read on. It says, surely he has borne our sicknesses and he carried our pain. Surely he has borne our sicknesses and he carried our pain. That's a literal translation of that. So where you see the word griefs, it means sicknesses. Where you see the word sorrows, it means pains. So, okay, let's just... Carry that in our thinking as we meditate on this. So surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Surely the Lord Jesus has borne my griefs and carried my sorrows. The Lord Jesus bore my griefs and sicknesses and he carried away my sorrows and my pains. Lord, thank you. You carried my sicknesses and my pains. You bore my sicknesses and my pains. Surely he has borne my griefs, my sicknesses, and he carried my sorrows and my pain. Surely, surely, it's an assured thing. It's a true thing. He carried my griefs. He carried my sicknesses. Jesus bore my griefs. Jesus bore my sicknesses. Today I decree Jesus bore my griefs. He bore my sickness. And remember what we said last time. Then I'm going to turn that as a praise to God. Father, I thank you today that I recognize that Jesus carried, he bore my sicknesses. And he carried away all of my pains. So I am honored, I'm privileged today to understand that my pains, my sicknesses were laid upon the Lord Jesus. He carried, he bore those things for me. I'm honored, I'm privileged as I recognize that all my griefs, all my sorrows were laid upon Jesus. All my griefs, all my sorrows were laid upon him. All my sicknesses and all my pains were laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, I refuse to carry any sickness. I refuse to carry any pain. 
I come against every sickness. I come against every pain in my body this moment. And I decree Jesus bore my sickness. Jesus bore my griefs. He bore my sorrows and pains. Therefore, I refuse sickness from my body. I refuse pain from my body. In Jesus' mighty name. I reject it. It has no right to me. It should not exist in me. And I refuse it in the mighty name of Jesus. I refuse it in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, I honor you right now for the truth of your word. I honor you right now for the truth of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was my substitute. He took, he bore my sicknesses and my griefs. He carried my sorrows and my pains. And therefore I am free in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. It's beautiful. I'm encouraging you spend time in that. Spend time in that. I'm not denying sickness and disease. I'm not pretending it's not there. If it is there, I am confronting it with the truth of what the word says. Did it say Jesus took your griefs? Yes, it did. Did it say he took your sorrows? Yes, it did. Did it, does that mean he took your sicknesses? Yes, it does. Does that mean he took your pains? Yes, it does. Jesus bore it all. That's why when he came, he came with such power and demonstration of the gospel, the good news, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, bringing, bringing sickness down and elevating health in people's lives. We, the church of God, are being raised up for the same purpose. And I encourage you to make it personal. Spend time in the scriptures. Let me close, excuse me, let me close with this scripture here from Psalm 35, verse 27. It says this, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause and let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all day long. And I'm closing with that scripture because I want to emphasize again the continuity of keeping the word in our mouth. So as we go, as we separate today, I'm encouraging you. He says this, say continually. What does continually mean? Continually! <laughs> say it on and on and on. Keep saying it, keep saying it, keep saying it. Do you, do you recognize that you've been out of practice on this? Huh? Instead of whining and moaning, we could be saying this. The Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. When you wake up, say it. When tough times are coming, say it. When you've got a red letter bill, pick the bill up and say, the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And just make sure you put in there, I am his servant. <laughs> he has pleasure in your prosperity. Oh, don't you ever start thinking that God has pleasure in your poverty. No, he has pleasure in your prosperity. I can tell there are not many believers shouting this out. There are not belie many believers saying this because a lot of believers don't believe this. They don't believe it because they're not applying it. They're not meditating on it. He says, say it continually. And he says in verse 28, my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all day long. That's what David was committed to, singing God's praise, shouting God's praise all day long. Man, are you going through trouble today? Are you going through challenges? Put the word of God back in your mouth. Repent that we've let the word go. Repent that we have been so casual about this. And get the word going back in your mouth. You feel an ache, you feel a pain, bring the word of God to bear on it. You're facing troubles and challenges in your life, bring the word of God back into your mouth. Stop giving in to the enemy and to his tactics and to his schemes. And then we're just voicing everything that our fear says. We're voicing all the things that, our, 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 that the pressure is saying. Put the word in your mouth. God loves you. I love you. In Jesus' name.